Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing N-linked glycosylation of proteins. Okay, so at the moment what we're doing is discussing uh, the glycosyl structure that we want to actually add on to proteins and how you build uh, that glycosyl structure. So, so far what we've done is we've t looked at the molecule dolichol, uh, which is in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. We've seen how you can add on two of these uh, N-acetylglucosamine uh, molecules onto dolichol. Now what we're going to see is the next molecule that you're going to add on, which is going to be a mannose uh, molecule. So we now need to discuss the structure of mannose, and this is where it becomes important that you understand uh, the uh, orientation of the hydroxyl groups and why those are going to become important, because unless you understand that, when you look at the structure of mannose, you will say that's exactly the same as the structure of glucose, and I will say no, it's not. So, uh, let's look now at the structure of Initially, what we're going to look at is the structure of beta D manopyranose, uh, which is the specific isomer of mannose that's going to be used uh, in uh, our um, glycosyl structure that we're building. So, again, it's uh, this six membered ring where five of the members are uh, carbon and then one of the members is oxygen, like so. And then, uh, coming off this fifth carbon, you then have this sixth carbon, which is still coming out of the page at us, basically, at the moment. So this is CH2OH here. Okay. And uh, then uh, the other groups now off here. So we'll start off with these off the second and third carbon, because those are the important ones that are going to differentiate mannose from glucose. So in glucose, what we had is this hydroxyl group coming out of the page at us on carbon-1. And in mannose, it's the same. What's going to change is that in the case of glucose, uh, this uh, hydroxyl group of the second carbon was going into the page. Now, in the case of mannose, it's going to come out of the page here. Okay, so that now uh, is... The, that is the um, important feature of mannose, that you have these two hydroxyl groups coming off um, off these um, second and third carbons that are coming both out of the page, whereas in glucose, one this one off the third carbon was coming out of the page, and the one off the second carbon was going into the page. So now they're coming off in the same direction. And then other than that, the naming of beta and alpha follows exactly the same principle as glucose. So this hydroxyl group still goes into the page. And then in the case of beta glu uh, beta mannose, rather, beta manopyranose strictly is the isomer we're talking about, uh, what's going to happen is this hydroxyl group is going to be coming out of the page here. Whereas in the case of the alpha isomer, it will be going into the page. So this, strictly speaking, is beta uh, D manopyranose. Beta D manopyranose. Like so. Pyranose. Okay, right. And this is the next um, sugar that we're going to add on to our glycosyl unit which we are building. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our beta D manopyranose and we're going to glycosidically link it with this N acetylglucosamine. So remember this N acetylglucosamine here was oriented in exactly the same way as this one is here. So this first hydroxyl group here was linked to the fourth hydroxyl group of this N-acetylglucosamine, which leaves this hydro fourth hydroxyl group here uh, free on this N-acetylglucosamine molecule. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this, um, this hydroxyl group of the first carbon of mannose and link it to this hydroxyl group of the fourth carbon of N-acetylglucosamine. So what we're going to do is add on a mannose here. So we'll draw this like so, an M. Okay, and again, that's going to be by a glycosidic link. Now, we'll colour in mannose a different colour, not blue. We'll have it in pink. Okay, so here's our mannose. Right. Okay, so that's our third sugar added on. Now, what we're going to continue on doing is we're going to continue adding mannose sugars onto this. Now, we're not just going to do them, however, in a linear line. Instead, what we're going to do is bifurcate it in a more complicated way. So what we're going to do is we're going to link the next mannose sugars off of uh, this hydroxyl group here and this hydroxyl group here. So you're going to continue linking mannoses 
off here. And the way you're going to do it is you're going to get two mannose sugars coming off here. So let's have these two as mannose. Okay. So we've now got these two separate mannoses coming off the end here. Okay. And then uh, this one here is going to bifurcate again. So it's going to give off, it's going to link off to two separate mannoses along here, like so. Okay. And now that terminates what we're going to build in this stage of the process. So we've now um, added on five mannose groups onto this structure. Okay, and we've linked them more complicatedly than if you had just linked them linearly. Uh, but in effect, all we're doing is forming these glycosidic bonds between hydroxyl groups of the mannose sugars. Right, okay, now what's going to happen is that this dolichol is going to flip, basically, in the ER membrane. It's going to take this entire um, glue, uh, well, sugar group that you've created, this glycosyl group that we've created here, and it's going to flip it onto the endoplasmic reticular luminal side, basically. Okay, so let's go over the page and draw that. So what's now happened is we've flipped in this membrane. So here's the ER membrane here. ER membrane. Okay, and the dolichol has flipped in that EAR membrane so that now the entire glycosyl group that you have created here, so this is the dolichol here, the entire glycosyl group that you've created is now facing the ER lumen side rather than the cytoplasm. So this here is the ER lumen here. And this here is the cytoplasm, so you've flipped in the membrane. And the mechanisms by which this happens are not well understood at all. Okay, so uh, these, these two circles here represent these two phosphate groups that are attached to the hydroxyl group of that dolichol molecule. And then after that, what we have is these two N-acetylglucosamine molecules, which are linked by glycosidic bonds onto these phosphate groups. So here's N-acetylglucosamine, here's another n glucosamine, and then after that, remember, we have this uh, beta-D-manopyranose, or what we're just going to call mannose, because it's just a specific isomer of mannose, and then it splits into, okay, so you've got a, another mannose here, another mannose here, so you bifurcate the chain into two separate ones, and then you bifurcate the chain again off one of these, so you create overall these three growing chains, basically. Okay, and that's how far we got on the cytoplasmic side. Now that we've flipped onto the endoplasmic reticulum luminal side, what we're going to do is alter uh, this glycosyl chain. We're going to extend it even further, basically. Okay, so blue for mannose, and we'll have, sorry, blue for n acetyl glucosamine, and we'll have pink for N, or mannose here. Specifically, um, the beta. Um, D manopyranose unit. And I think some of these uh, mano subunits aren't actually in the beta conformation. I think some of them will be in the alpha conformation, but they are all manopyranose, which means they're all in these six membered rings. Right, okay, now what's going to happen is you're going to extend this even further. In the endoplasmic reticulum luminal side, what's going to happen is that you're going to continue adding bits on. So you're going to add on more mano. So I'm going to draw some sort of lines to show us what we made on the cytoplasmic side. So I'll draw this sort of line here. So this was what we had created on the uh, cytoplasmic side and which has now flipped. What we're going to add on now is the extension, the bits that have been modified on the ER luminal side. So this chain here is going to be extended you're going to add two more mannose groups here. And now, finally, what you're going to add on is some glucose units here. Okay. And again, I think they're a mixture of alpha and beta glucose. But again, they're, ma um, they're glucopyranose. Okay. So they're the six-membered rings rather than uh, being linear or being in five-membered rings. Right. Okay, so we will um, cover these in the same colour. We'll use the same abbreviation. So mannose is in pink here. So these are mannose. You add on two extra mannoses to give overall three mannoses in this chain. And then you have uh, these glucoses, which we all denote in green. So here's glucose for green for glucose. 
Okay, and we've added on these three glucoses on the end. Now, we're also going to extend this chain by a little bit, but only by two extras. So we're going to add on two extras here. We're going to add on a mannose to each of them, and another mannose on this one here. Okay, so that's, that is the modification that now occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum lumen. And this whole structure that we have now created is called a glycosyl group. And this is what we're going to stick onto our proteins. So now what we need to discuss is how we're going to actually stick it onto our proteins. So remember, we are facing the ER lumen now. So let's say we've got our protein here. Okay, so here is our protein, and we need to discuss what residues of the protein are we going to add this onto, and also what, how do we obtain specificity, how do we specifically add it onto specific um, points of the protein, basically. So in red, this is the protein. Okay, so protein or polypeptide, or whatever you want to call it, which is in the membrane, because remember, the ER is when proteins are sent if they're targeted for the membrane. When they go into the ER, the translocon uh, organizes them so that they get the correct membrane-spanning topology, and then they sit in the endoplasmic reticulum, and then they're going to be targeted to where they are going to go, uh, which is a process we haven't looked at yet. Now, basically, uh, what you can do is you can add this group onto asparagine residue. So let's say this protein happens to have an asparagine residue here. Now let me just remind you of the structure of asparagine. So this is asparagine. Asparagine. Okay. And um, basically it's um, it's um, it's the amide of gluten. Uh, oh, sorry, not of glutamate. Aspartate, I should hope. Right, so let me draw the structure of this amino acid. So, let's start off with the core structure of an amino acid. So, here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon. And off the alpha carbon, you then have the carboxylic acid group down here. Okay, now, whoops. Um, sorry, my computer just turned off. It's never done that before. Okay, so um, then the R group for asparagine is that you have these two carbons here, okay? And then you would have a carboxylic acid group here, but you've formed an amide link. So you've now got uh, this primary amide group here, okay? And then it's just a two-carbon structure. So this now is the structure of the amino acid asparagine, often denoted ASN. Okay, right. Now, here's a question. Do we add this, this huge, great group onto any old, um, any old asparagine residue? Well, of course, the answer is no. Uh, instead, uh, there are some specific requirements. The first one is that it has to be in a certain sequence of amino acids. So you can't just add on uh, this group, to, this glycosyl group, to any old asparagine. It has to be in a certain uh, consensus sequence, as they're called. So what you need to have is a certain region in the polypeptide known as a consensus sequence, which basically tells you uh, that you should add a, a glycosyl group onto the asparagine that is in that consensus sequence. Okay, so let me give you the um, examples of uh, aspar oh, well, of consensus sequences that are known. Okay, so um, one of them that is very common is that you will have an asparagine, okay, followed by some amino acid that we don't care about, so I'll just put an X there to denote that it could be anything, and then you'll have a serine. So basically, if your polypeptide has this amino acid code, it has an asparagine followed by anything else, and then a serine uh, next, that's a consensus sequence, and that will mark this asparagine to have one of these glycosyl groups put onto it. So an asparagine followed by anything, and then a serine. Alternatively, you can have an asparagine, again followed by anything, and then a threonine amino acid. Okay, so that's another example of a consensus sequence. And finally, you can have an asparagine followed by anything, 
followed by a cysteine. That will also act as a consensus sequence for having uh, a glycosyl uh, unit added on to this asparagine. And you'll notice that all three of these amino acids here, serine, threonine, and cysteine, they all have um, they all have kind of alcohol groups. Okay, this one has a thiol group. A thiol group has similar properties to an alcohol group. So let me draw the structures of these, and you'll notice what I'm talking about here. So, uh, if we draw the generic amino acid structure here, so here's the amino group, the alpha carbon with a hydrogen off it, the carboxylic acid group coming down here, okay? Now, in the case of serine, what you have in this R group, and I, to avoid having to draw out the whole backbone, I'll just put R there. Now, in the case of serine, what you have as the R group is you have a methylene group with a hydroxyl group, so this is serine, or S-E-R for short. Uh, so basically you stick that in place of the R. Okay. Now in the case of threonine, it's a very similar amino acid to serine. It's almost identical basically. Uh, you have a carbon with this hydroxyl group and a hydrogen down here, but then a methyl group sticking off it here. So again you've got this very similar side chain. And then with cysteine, Cysteine again has a very similar structure. It has a single carbon and then it has a thiol group which has similar properties to the alcohol group. Okay, so they all are slightly similar and you'll notice the similarity between those three. Okay, so if you have this, the one of these sequences in a polypeptide, then you can add a um, glycosyl group onto that asparagine. Okay, and I will tell you how exactly what, what we're going to do when we add a glycosyl group onto uh, an asparagine. Uh, but at the moment, I just want to tell you what um, properties the asparagine needs to have in order to have it added on. So it needs to be in one of these consensus sequences. In addition, it needs to be visible. Okay, that's plain common sense. If it's buried deep within the structure of the protein, you're not going to be able to add a glycosyl group on. It needs to be sticking out, and also it needs to be on the luminal side. It's no good having it sticking out on the cytoplasmic side. You're not going to be able to add this on to the cytoplasmic side. It can only be added on to asparagines, which are plainly visible in consensus sequences on the luminal side. So those are the three requirements. It needs to be in a consensus sequence it needs to be visible, so it needs to be exposed, and it needs to be luminal on the ER lumen side. Okay, right. Now what you can do is basically uh, you can uh, cut this bond between... Uh, what colour should I show this in? I'll do it in this pink. Uh, we can cut this bond between the phosphate group and the n glucosamine, which, remember, was this phosphate ester bond between the hydroxyl group of a phosphate group and the hydroxyl group of the first carbon of this n glucosamine, And we can instead link that hydroxyl group with this amine group over here, basically. And uh, that is going to be how we can link this entire glycosyl um, group, as it's called, onto, uh, the, um, gr uh, onto the R chain of our asparagine. Okay. And um, so let me just show this happening. So basically what you're going to have happening is uh, you're going to have a condensation reaction occurring where you remove the hydroxyl group from the n glucosamine and instead you bind that uh, first carbon to the nitrogen. Okay, so how should I show this? So uh, let's take these two hydrogens off, like so. So one hydrogen's come off and has gone off with the hydroxyl from the n glucosamine and then what you'll have bound here is this n glucosamine and then it'll continue on, basically. You'll have this entire array of uh, sugars, basically, this glycosyl group stuck on the side of your protein. Now, that is the process of N-linked glycosylation, adding this massive, great glycosyl group, which is made up of carbohydrates linked together, onto uh, the side of asparagine residues in your protein.